Welcome to the Investor Shed Podcast with Nick Beveridge, the ultimate source for all things investing and beyond. For free tools, tips, and tricks, go to NorthIdahoREI.com. Jacob Evans is the CEO at Spokane Superior Solutions. He has been a full-time investor for over 12 years, and his company is one of the largest real estate acquisition companies in Spokane. Listen in as he tells his story. So I should probably introduce you. This is uh, Jacob Evans. Go by Jake or Jacob? Go Jake. by Jake, yeah. Jake, Jake mm-hmm. Evans, everyone. Um, you are a um, mega investor out mostly in the um, <clears throat> state of Washington, I guess you can say, right? Oh, uh, yeah, mostly. Mm-hmm. Okay. I forgot to do the clap. Sorry, Jeremy. Doing that in the middle. <laughs> Syncing up audio right. with the video. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, okay. So tell me, what, what got you uh, interested in real estate? Oh man, just a lot of flip flip this house shows on TV. Yeah, honestly, yeah. Flip I was yeah, I was in the Air Force and working the late night shift, and just got just got to watching way too much reality television. How old were you at the time? I was. Um, I mean, I I got started full time when I was twenty two, but I okay. started I started really getting into the shows and all the money they were making on TV when I was when I was in my twenty early twenties. Okay, and That's how old are you now? 35. 35, okay. So it's yeah. been over a decade now of you doing this? Yeah, full time since 07. Right on. Mm-hmm. So you started just before things crashed or as they were crashing? Yeah, as they were, as the sink was shipping, or sinking, as the ship was shipping, <laughs> I was getting into, into it full time, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So what, what did you do in the, you said Air Force? Yeah, Air Force. I was computer communications. So okay. mostly, mostly just working the help desk. Telling people to restart their computers, taking taking calls, tr- just troubleshooting over the phone mostly. Gotcha. And um, the Air Force was cool. It gave me kind of gave me some time to grow up, but uh, it just you know my 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 twenty year career was pretty well planned out, and there there I just didn't have as much control over my destiny I guess as I as I wanted. So yeah, real estate was really attractive to me for that reason. Okay, specifically. And you first got interested just watching the reality shows on HGTV. Yeah, I mean that, or, and I mean I'm being a little bit coy, but there yeah. was there was that, and um, I was actually I was dating a girl at the time who was big into buying rental properties. Her and her dad. Really? Yeah. Okay. They, they teamed up, and and uh, he was kind of the financial backing, and she she managed the house and found found the properties, and I and I saw then firsthand that there was real money to be made in rental property, oh. and then. Um, he, her, her dad actually um, was open to partnering with me on doing a flip when I got out of the Air Force, and so, so okay. we did. We we got that kind of got that rolling that way. Nice. But so I why re- would, why would he partner with you? What what would be your value bringing in? Oh well, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, okay. Well, but you're okay. So you're 22. Um, right, right. He's got all this experience. Mm-hmm. What? Why would somebody partner with a 22 year old? Uh, we were going to no go, experience. we were going to go 50, 50 and he saw, he saw a chance to make some money. I guess he believed me when I said I was going to make us some money. I mean, D- so did you bring him a deal or did he bring you a deal? I brought, I brought him the deal and we actually found it through a realtor. Okay. Um, and, um, and then I said, I, I do all the work. I'll do all the labor. I'll swing the, I'll swing hammer. Okay. And hire and fire and do all that. And we'll split profits 50, 50. And he was, he was game. Gotcha. I also, I also funded, I, <laughs> This is I actually funded material costs on the credit card, and I, I, and I did I, the same thing on my first you? flip. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I used my wife's um, American Express. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I put I put half. I guess I put. Cause I had some savings coming out of the Air Force, but yeah, a lot of it went on credit cards, just nice. to get that first one done. I mean, they so, make it look so easy on TV, don't they? It's just ridiculous. They make it look pretty easy, mm-hmm. and they don't really get bogged down with details of what actual <laughs> selling costs are and what actual financing costs could be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And all that stuff. It's, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's comical. They focus mostly on the rehab mm-hmm. on those shows. Mm-hmm. And that's just a little bit, just a little part of it. Oh, yeah. And then, and then you know, you have an open house and it sells that day and everything's good. <laughs> 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 Full price over asking. Yeah, yeah, every time. Every time, yeah. Yeah, those shows are fun. So, um... So did you finish the Air Force? Did you do your full four years? Uh, I got I, no. I did my full four years. <laughs> that'd, be a, <laughs> that'd be another story if I if I got booted. But no, I was I managed to keep it together for the full four years. Um, okay. And then another thing was I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that was kind okay. of a that was a light bulb moment for me. 
from, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. Oh, I, I was the same way. Was yeah. it? I was 18, 19. Mm-hmm. Um, I listened to it. I couldn't read at the time. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I was pretty retarded. It still am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But um, yeah, I th- the, the I that was the first time I actually started reading books. I mean, mm. during high school and mm. so I was, I would yeah. You're supposed to go home and read books, you know, yeah. for projects and stuff. I wouldn't read it. No, it's, it's boring. Yeah, exactly. So by default, I couldn't really read well. <laughs> oh wow. But, but the those kind of books like Rich Dad Poor Dad and some other books that like remember that book that he uh, co wrote with Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. It was like one of the first books I actually read. Oh, okay. But um, I, I know how to read now. Okay, good. <laughs> Glad we got the guns. You got that sorted. Sorry, that was an alarm. That's uh, okay. Yeah, but um, Rich Dad Poor Dad totally changed my mindset on like actual like having a job versus owning a job versus mm-hmm. um, owning a business and investing. It's pretty awesome how he breaks all that down. Yeah, and at the time, I was in the military at the time. He didn't even go into the super corporate lifestyle of military life. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, after getting a taste of that, I kind of imagined the corporations were similarly structured, and I just, I wanted to go, I kind of just went the opposite direction yeah. in a lot of ways, just looking for ultimate freedom. What I found was something different. I mean, th- this this entrepreneur journey is something else entirely. I really didn't anticipate what what exactly I was getting myself into when I when I set off on this journey. But it's been really rewarding. It's been mm-hmm. really rewarding um, and challenging, extremely challenging. So, what? How old were you again when you read Rich Dad Poor Dad? I was pro- I was probably twenty or twenty one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And then just before year or two out, later, you. Yeah, you start venturing like, into real estate. Mm-hmm. A year or two later, I went to move to Texas to partner up with the girlfriend's dad and flip oh, a house. Oh, you went to Texas. Okay. Yeah, that was that's where she relocated. That's where most of their rental properties were. Okay. And so I relocated to uh, to stay there and, and flip a house and, and get stuff rolling. What part of Texas? San Antonio. San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Beautiful area, actually. Yeah. Actually, really nice down there. That is. That's mm-hmm. off the I-10, right? Nearby. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um. I'm pretty sure it broke down about 20 minutes outside of San Antonio. Did you? What were you, what were you doing down there? I was dry, I was moving from Florida to uh, Idaho. Oh, no way. <laughs> moving Jeez. back. And um, I, th- I think it was San Antonio. Yeah, I broke down just outside of town. And mm-hmm. I was, my problem, I was pulling a trailer with a, a little Chrysler LeBaron. <laughs> yeah. So it, it didn't like that. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, Broke down and had to get a, um, yeah, had to go into debt and get a U-Haul to um, pull my Chrysler LeBaron home. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. Totally different story. That's but. a long, that's a long journey. Jeez. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Break down about the midway point. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So when when did you move into the uh, Northwest area? Uh, well, so I grew up on the on the West Coast. Okay. Um, and then I went into the Air Force and then moved back. Instead of going back to the Seattle area, just because I couldn't stay in the gray um, mm-hmm. and the traffic was getting kind of crazy, I decided I decided to move close by on mom's orders. <laughs> no, no. Did mom live in this area? Uh, she, she lived on the coast at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I moved to Spokane because it just seemed like a really strong rental market and pretty stable, yeah. stable market compared to the rest of the country. It was getting pretty volatile. Okay. So... So and what what year was this? This had to be um, oh like beginning of oh eight probably like June oh eight I moved to Spokane. Gotcha. That same that's that same uh, that Friday I moved into town from Wednesday. That same Friday I bought a foreclosure auction property from the old uh, Vestas guys down at the foreclosure auction down there. So what's that? What's the Vestas guys? Yeah, what's so that? they um, they provide auction services. So they assist investors with buying properties at the auction and they okay. also provide hard money because um, oh. you have to have cash to purchase mm-hmm. so they they bring cash and and they'll help you out with p- finding a property and buying it and that was my that was my first f- uh, solo flip purchase here in in Spokane area nice so so what are their terms look like are they pretty reasonable or are they pretty aggressive um I mean it's you know they're pretty standard market rates. I think okay. they're black. I haven't bought in there in probably a year and a half, two years actually. I haven't bought it in the foreclosure option, but 
at the time it was three percent of the tax assessed value mm -hmm. and I mean regardless it's just kind of a matter of penciling in all the costs you know so um, I would just factor for their commission factor for hard money estimate for a six-month hold and then go down there with my number and and hope for the best you know gotcha yeah so at this point, what kind of what kind of experience did you have coming from Texas? Like, how many houses did you work on down there? <laughs> I just done the one. I just mean, one. Okay. Yeah, just done the one with the with the girlfriend's dad. That that blew up pretty quick. Right after that first one, it was obvious it wasn't going to be a long term fit. So, um, kind of uh, yeah, just kind of packed it out of town and then headed to Spokane. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So it didn't go well. <laughs> I mean, we made money on, on the first one, but yeah, it was just, it was not the ideal partnership. You know, that's just how it goes sometimes. I, we, I was young too. Everybody was young, but. What, what kind of, um, what kind of things would you avoid in the future based off what you learned there? Oh man. I mean, you don't, you don't realize how naive you are. you like, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so, um, like looking back on that whole scenario, I would have done everything different. I wouldn't have even been in that situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was. It ended up kind of being. Um, I mean, I don't want to go into too much details or slander anybody necessarily, but mm -hmm. um, it just. It was. Uh, it's very important to to pick your partnerships and and know who you're getting into business with. Yeah. And they didn't. They didn't tell me that on TV. <laughs> you know. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so it's been a real. It's been, just been a long process of trial and error. You know, and after after a decade in the business, I've just you just make all the mistakes you're gonna make because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And you hope you you hope you can you know muster muster through it and keep on pressing forward. Yeah, it almost doesn't matter what they teach you in a seminar. You're going to make the mistakes anyway. Exactly, yeah. And I, <laughs> it was a podcast. You guys, I don't remember who you did it with. I think it may have been David Clinton. But you guys were talking about how um, you can even be told exactly what you should and shouldn't do. And you still may end up in that same, that same trap, you know. And that's, mm -hmm. been, that's been so true of my career. I've even made the same mistakes multiple times. That's yeah. how... <laughs> that's how thick-headed I can be, you know, like, that's when it's extra frustrating, like, are you kidding me, I already, I already paid, yeah. you know, 10, 20 grand to learn that lesson, and here I am paying for it again. <laughs> it's like, how many times do I have to keep using the same person and <laughs> yeah. getting the same oh, results? <laughs> yeah. And thinking it's going to be different this time. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, yeah, that's, so, that's yeah. super true. I can totally relate. I can okay. totally I'm sure we all can. And, yeah, without going into too much detail. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I mean, it's it's funny, man. It's like, um, you know, everybody wants to, you know, you want to you wanna, you wanna catch advice on the podcast and all these things, but the, the best teacher is just getting out there and failing your way forward, you know, as that, yeah. as that book goes. Failure is a great teacher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you try to avoid it as much as you can, but sometimes it's just, you just, you just, walk right into it you just didn't see it coming there's really nothing you could do yeah. and also I, I really think like as much as much like advice as we can get as much planning and as much experience as we can accumulate we're we're not in we're not as in as much control as we like to think we are i mean there are there are just probably way more factors outside of and beyond our control than there are within our control and, and i think it's just kind of important to stay flexible and stay resilient through all yeah. that stuff because there are so many people involved in a real estate transaction, especially mm -hmm. when you throw in the mix of flipping a house too at the oh, same man. time. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And, and if you if you want to scale, there'd be a hundred people involved if you like, mm -hmm. count them all up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And absolutely. you just um, and just one of those people can have a bad day or they can't make it and it can throw off your whole transaction. Mm -hmm. and... Hundred percent. Yeah, you're relying on a lot of different people to uh, mm -hmm. to get it all done. People so are. I mean, I hate to harp on people they're great but at the same time they're they're the x factor in all this you know it's really about trying to build trying to build a good team of people yeah yeah and and uh that's that takes time man it just takes time to find the right folks i think it does take time mm -hmm. yeah yeah the people you surround yourself with in this industry are going to make or break you absolutely um you can be a complete dummy like me and fortunately i've surrounded myself with great people <laughs> mm -hmm. and i've 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 had some success with mm -hmm. um, flips and rentals and all that stuff, and I, it's all because of the people that I've surrounded myself with. It has nothing to do with me because I can't do anything. I just I, I sit here like in a wet diaper, 
just oh, crying <laughs> until people fix stuff for me. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, I mean, that may be an exaggeration, I'm sure, but I'd say one of your strengths probably, given what we're doing right now even, is, is formulating uh, relationships and making those connections. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's an invaluable skill set, man. Like, congrats on, on kind of seeing that as, as, a, as a good path to go down because... Thank you. Like like you're saying, I think it's it's gonna serve you well, and it already has probably. Well, you just you just begin to learn over time that you that that should be a priority, mm-hmm. or or you start looking back at your track history of what's worked for you in the past mm-hmm. and what doesn't. Yeah. And if you actually take a moment every week to look at what transactions you have going on, where do they come from? Mm-hmm. Where do they really come from? Mm-hmm. And go back and just keep backtracking. Oh, it was because I made this one connection. That one time. Right. Yeah. What if I just made connections? <laughs> you know? And then just have the right people surrounding my team where I can give the work to. Yeah. Um, yeah, your network is your net worth type of a mm-hmm. scenario for sure. As long as everybody wins. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. I think that's what it's all about, man. Like, the, the value is created in finding those, those win-wins, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Light's going off. <laughs> Come on. There it goes. Uh, there it goes. <laughs> It's happened every every podcast that's happened. Has it really? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you ever watch The Office? Oh, I love The Office. I've watched it through a few times. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Where, where they reinstalled the lights. <laughs> yeah. where everybody has to Dwight took over as landlord of yeah. the building. Yeah, and made a whole lot of changes for the tenants to. That's who we have as a landlord. <laughs> we have Dwight Schrute. Is that what <laughs> We're in here. Yeah. Oh, that's that's such a great scene. Actually, that whole episode <laughs> as a real cool. estate guy, I'm like, oh, this is a good one. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, okay, so take me back. It's 2008. Mm-hmm. The market's rocking in the area, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And you decide to be a full time. What what are you at this point? Area house flipper, a wholesaler? Do you buy um, rentals? Do you even know yeah. what you're doing at this point? Prime Do you have a team? My one thing right now is uh, is wholesaling, mostly. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And but at the time, at the time, yeah, and at the time of OA, I was gonna be. I just wanted to be a massive house flipper. Just house flipper. Okay. Or to flip as many as I could, make all that money. <laughs> you uh-huh. know? And uh, and then and then just keep on. I wonder what I wanted to do is is I wanted to flip houses like McDonald's flips cheeseburgers. My whole my whole vision was to build a system around building or flipping houses. Yeah. That didn't require my didn't require my involvement. Okay. And so. Did you ever read that book Flip? By Gary Keller? Oh, no, I didn't read that one, no. But Gary Keller, I like his other one, Shift. Mm-hmm. That one was a good one. Yeah, they have a great book on just flipping. Ha- well, they have the Millionaire Real Estate Investor book mm-hmm. that I mm-hmm. preach all the time. But they also have phenomenal systems in this book called Flip. I would check it out. It's a green cover. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But it just, it's, it's just... It's like McDonald's for flipping houses. System it's for got, flipping. It's, all, it's a book full of systems. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I would, I would check it out if you yeah. have, have time. Yeah. I don't I've, know if you read books still or not. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, big time reader. Yeah, but I've, I've actually I've ventured away from flips. I think that the, the market's kind of tough right now for flipping houses. It is. Um, not because, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a sure bet. I mean, if you can find a good flip, it, you're, there's not a whole lot of risk involved. So let's you know, asterisk that, but, um, like you mean as far as reselling? Yeah. As far as reselling, you're not taking a gamble. Like the thing is going to sell and you have a pretty good idea of where it's going to sell and it's not going to take a long time. When I was flipping houses, the market had, the bottom had fallen out and I I was guessing a lot of times at the actual resale number and I had no, I had no long, no idea how long it was going to take. I mean, average days on market was over 90 days in some, some cases. At that time, did you have a lot of competition? No, I would say no. I would remember getting into the game and hearing about all these big time, big names who had just gotten out of the game. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and I left me kind of scratching my head. I wasn't sure if maybe they'd just kind of um, just kind of been been pushed out, or if they just decided that the money wasn't good enough, they're going to move on to something else. But I kind of just said, hey, if I if I factor for worst case scenario and I build all of my costs into my um, you know my purchase price. I should be I should be all right, mm-hmm. and I just went with that formula, and it seems to be working out. Yeah, there was there was more opportunity to flip houses than I I ever accumulated than the cash for and the team for. I mean, at our peak, we were we were buying fifty flips a year, and wow. 
and uh, and it was it was automated. It was run like running like a really well oiled machine. Um, but yeah, and, and the opportunities were there. You know, like yeah. it wasn't a matter of a shortage of opportunities like there is now. Where did most of those opportunities come from at the time? I was, I, man, I was literally just showing up to the foreclosure auction, courthouse steps, and then just raising my hand. Like that was how that was how hard it was to. So just about everything flip. penciled out, but it was not such a sure bet as far as reselling. The, the demand right. wasn't as strong. Yeah, it was wasn't. It was difficult. My bottlenecks were finding investors who wanted to gamble on the market and okay. it not just nose diving even further. Gotcha. And who were also like everybody was gun shy at the time about real estate. Real estate was not the hot, you know, commodity kind of that it is now. It was yeah. I was like, Oh I'm a I'm a house flipper, I'm a real estate investor, like, oh pff, good luck, dude, you yeah. know. Um, and that's the time to get in when nobody exactly, wants to be there. <laughs> exactly right, man. <laughs> Makes like, you scratch your head about what we're doing now. Dude, because like, everybody's construction costs awesome. were like half what they are. Yeah. You know, opportunities were everywhere to buy buy flip properties. But I couldn't get anybody. It was tough to get people on board to, to actually, you know, take down properties and get it done. So, and it's it's funny because it's the exact opposite now. Now construction costs are sky high, and opportunities just don't seem to be be as available. Every but, lender says yes without even looking at a house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And but every investor is like, let me know when you need that blank check, dude. Like, let's go. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to make some money flipping houses. I was like, where were you a decade ago, man? <laughs> like, that was the time. Yeah, but um, now now I really think that it's the like it's the era of landlords. Like now it's now it's rent that is going sky high. Yeah, and it's it's other landlords who are kind of like, man, I wrote out the I wrote out the last decade, and I'm kind of ready to ready to unload, turn it over to the next landlord to spruce it up and, and then maximize rents. It's hmm. kind of what I, I think it's going to be a pretty I think it's going to be the b biggest feeding frenzy for landlords we've seen this spring. And summer, okay. I, think, I, I, mean, per, I mean, that's just my prediction. I think a yeah. lot of, I think a lot of rental property is going to change hands in the, over the next couple of years. Yeah, it could be. It. Yeah, and there's a lot of big things happening in this area. Yeah, I, yeah. I was just driving around. So much new construction here too. It seems ridiculous amount of apartments are being built too. Are they? Are you in North yeah. Idaho? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the supply is questionable whether it's going to be too much yeah. when they're all finished building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's that's always bound to happen. Yeah. You know, builders it's, overbuild and that's what brings the market down eventually. Mm -hmm. It's all supply and demand. Yeah, teeter totters, but right? Yeah, right now the the supply is just not there. <laughs> well, you think like nobody was doing new construction for the last decade, you know, all the loans that were available to developers evaporated. Mm -hmm. Um and then it just wasn't the same surefire bet that it was. And your your exit strategy on a development project's pretty pretty long. You know, yeah. so you've got to for you got to feel pretty confident forecasting the market for a little while, mm -hmm. in order to jump in. And nobody was comfortable doing that for the last you know, ten eight to ten years. Yeah, but I think like the demand was was always going to be there. People kept on you know building families and getting older and stuff. But um, kind of de development went away. So I th I think I don't know if it's true here, but in Spokane, I definitely have the feeling that there's. There's a ways to go before the demand for housing has been set, has kind of caught up with, with the uh, the hangover of the recession, but that's just my that's just my impression. Yeah, like inventory for rentals is crazy low still. It is. Mm -hmm. I'm really I'm kind of sick of trying to predict what the market's going to do. <laughs> Man, that's funny. I I I'm used just to rolling with it now. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's probably the best. That's all you can do really. The end yeah. of the day, but I've been I got I got hurt pretty bad by the, the by the last shift. Yeah, I mean I had a massive flip company, and then all of a sudden flip projects and construction costs um, changed overnight, which left us kind of scrambling to keep up. And so I used to I used to not really care. I mean I was I was small enough that it was like all right I'm just going to find my one project. I'll 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 stay flexible with whatever the market does, but. When I when I went to scale, I realized how how much the market and local policies and um, things that affected all the variable all the variables in the system, they were their effects were magnified. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So, oh, oh, definitely. So I I all of a sudden became a student of trying to see the big picture, I guess, because I think it's necessary if you want to scale. Mm-hmm. So what? So take me back, if you don't mind, 
And describe to me what it took to build up to 50, you know, doing 50 flips. Like, yeah. how did you, you, you immediately obviously got a property as soon as you moved here to the Spokane area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, did you get a partner again? Did you hire anybody? Yeah. Admin wise? I mean, how did you, how are you able to do that kind of volume? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, I mean, like I said, the limiting factor, the bottleneck was always access to cash, capital to invest into the flip business. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I when I got to Spokane, I, my first partner in Spokane was mom. Okay. Yeah, and so she um, she gave me a loan to buy property cash at the foreclosure auction, and then once again I kind of I swung hammer and I I made material runs. I started I started okay. slowly working my way out of the lower tier um, jobs. Yeah. And so I said, all right, well, so I'm going to replace. I'm gonna replace myself wherever I'm worth the least. So the guy running the wheelbarrow, yeah, I can I can replace myself for ten bucks an hour, eleven bucks an hour, and so I'll start there. So I just kind of slowly started firing myself and replacing myself from from the lowest tier positions, mm-hmm. and then just kind of um, scaled up from there. All the while accumulating more of my own capital and recruiting uh, additional investors to kind of scale things up. Were you pretty good with construction? Um, we're just gonna roll with it. <laughs> it's that. I was by no means a professional. No, um, it took me. Yeah, that's. It took me longer, and it didn't get as well done as a professional would do. Okay. Um, Did you start to realize that as well? Like, oh, I knew that going I'm, in. I'm wasting money by doing this on my own because <laughs> I could pay somebody for less than what I would mm-hmm. make if I'm just doing my job of lead generating or yeah. whatever that is. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that was most attractive about scaling was that I could replace myself um, with somebody who's actually better at doing the job, you know? Mm-hmm. And so um, my skill set is is relatively narrow. I mean, I'm not a jack of all trades type of a guy. I, I, can, uh, I can figure out how to get it done, but it's not gonna be, you know, as good as a professional could do. I learned that pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, yeah, I don't know why you got to call me out like that on your podcast, Nick, about my construction abilities, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm just curious. I, uh, well, because the, I guess the reason why I'm just trying to relate back to myself on my first flip, mm-hmm. uh, my first couple of flips, I didn't know anything about yeah. construction. I didn't even know how to do like drywall or yeah. any of that stuff. So, I mean, it was just like YouTube. Mm-hmm. Like I would literally, we'd have uh, the drywall in front of us watching YouTube on how to smear mud. You know, like yeah. my brother and I, we didn't know. Yeah. We just kind of had to start there. Oh, and then nice. we, we hired a guy, a, a more, um, he was like a handyman, but he, he, did, he knew a lot. Mm-hmm. Great job mm-hmm. for like 25 bucks an hour, basically his assistant. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and just learned how to, how to do everything from start to finish and YouTube with YouTube and just being like a handyman's assistant. Yeah. But dude, like, eventually that's so had, great. To get, had to get out of there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but the biggest thing is just getting after it, man. You know, just taking action. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think I've, I've, I've rarely known exactly what I was doing going into it. I was, but, but I've always just kind of, and I, th- I think the same is for, true for you too. You just have a belief that you're going to be able to figure it out. I think, yeah. that, I think that's the, key, that's the biggest thing, you know. <laughs> about anything <laughs> right because at the end of the day none of us we, we all like to think we know what we're doing but we're kind of just figuring it out as we go all the time all yeah all the time we think, yeah. yeah every real estate transaction is different you're mm-hmm. like haven't encountered this yet <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah we don't know it all but it's it's nice to have systems that kind of help us with 80 yeah. percent of it yeah something. and that's the only way to really scale mm-hmm. you, know, you start seeing patterns you do it enough times, you start seeing the patterns, and you document and delegate the patterns, and then just kind of build it out from there. Okay. Mm-hmm. So about um, so before before the, when did the market actually kind of really obviously start crashing in in Spokane? Um, are you saying fr- like from... after you bought that first foreclosure? Oh yeah. About how much it, time went? Yeah, I was. Um, I mean, after I right after I sold the first one in San Antonio, it mm-hmm. was it was obvious to anybody who's paying attention that the market was tanking. Okay. Yeah, and so when I bought in Spokane, I was I was projecting a, a lower. I was projecting to sell for less than what the comps were showing. By, by okay, so you market. already you were smart enough to figure that out right away. 
Yeah, like, yeah, I didn't get caught. Calculate some depreciation versus Definitely. depreciation, yeah. or just it's going to be this. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I was like, well, worst case scenario, it depreciates 10% every six months. Wow. I mean, so let's factor, I mean, let's try and factor in that into the numbers and yeah. get it done as quick as possible and hope for the best. Now, that, that was another thing is I was, and this was true for eight or 10 years, I wanted to put out a better product than my comps and be priced for less. Mm -hmm. And so I knew for sure that I would be the first one sold. Right. It'd be staged clean, you yep. know, like new. And as long as I was at or a little bit less than the comps, I was, I was good to go. And so that, a lot of times that meant not like, not aiming for the peak of the market, not over, over improving, but right. almost teetering towards under improving. Like, hey, this is a clean livable property for as much or less than the nearby comps. I'm just, I'm trying to move quick. I'm trying to do yeah. volume. And you're eliminating a lot of risk. You're not gambling. You're not exactly. throwing dice. You're just, yeah. I know I'm going to sell for this. So yeah. we're going to price it at that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe we'll get more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Maybe cross our fingers, but probably not. <laughs> um, and I think that's, I think that's not a very good recipe in today's environment. I think it might even be it's funner for sure to maybe over improve a little bit and see, you know, test the market a little bit and see what, what you might be able to get. It's hard just to get to the stage where you're putting your house on the market. Everybody wants to buy it before you're, mm -hmm. <laughs> before you're done. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, Oh, I might be under price in this thing, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, that's true. That was never a tough. problem we had to contend with No. before. Not so, exactly. <laughs> this is a totally different environment. But now I, I, I haven't done a ton of a ton of flips uh, in the last t year and a half, two years. Yeah. And I hear the really difficult thing is keeping construction costs in line. Because when I was doing it, I, I kind of named my price. You know, mm -hmm. I had I had I had five guys raising their hands. Named your construction price. Yeah, name my like I can pay price. this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, here's here's the job, and I'd done so many of them that it was like we're paying fifteen hundred dollars for this tile job. We're paying you know two grand for carpet install yeah and it was kind of like the next man up if the last guy didn't get it done well there were so many people looking for construction work that that was that was kind of the easy easier part yeah not necessarily but so in your in your flips were you um were you basically like a general contractor and, we, and you were subbing out all the all the different jobs in the house or did you work with a general contractor that just handled the whole project um, it kind of, uh, it, it kind of, it kind of changed as I grew. So when it, when I started, I swung hammer and mm -hmm. then I, and then I moved to just delivering materials, but paying guys hourly wages. Yep. And then I moved. That's what I've done for almost every, yeah, that's a great <laughs> for, way to do it. While. That's a great way to do but, it. You keep, you keep consistent eyes on the project. You there to answer mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Um, from there I hired on a GC who oversaw multiple projects. And then I hired on a project in-house project manager to oversee the GCs who were managing multiple projects. Okay. So at our peak, I had a full-time project manager overseeing five general contractors, and each of those GCs were they were overseeing you know between one and five projects at a time. Wow. Yeah. And so it was. I mean, you just kind of kept on kept on scaling. And you say, you keep saying our peak. So when was your peak? Do you um, remember what year? Yeah, it was like right when the right when the windstorm hit, um, two and a late half. Late two thousand fifteen. Yeah, late two thousand fifteen. Okay. Is when um, we were we were full stride, and mm -hmm. also the market had decided to turn almost overnight. I mean, foreclosures dried up, and then contractors were. Before I was like naming my price. Now they were no, just walking like, off I the can't. job. Yeah. Like, I can't. I've got a I'm ten, too busy. <laughs> yeah, I got a ten or fifteen percent margin on your stuff. Thanks for keeping us busy, you know, through but the recession. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but I just had a bid accepted on this roof uh -huh. for a two hundred percent markup, so uh, it's been real fun. But that has been a super big challenge keeping quality contractors on the job. Oh yeah, because it, lately, yeah, I've the last uh, the last couple of flips I've done pretty pretty tough. Oh, I bet. Just because yeah. you're dealing with, um, that you're not dealing with the contractors that you wish you would have had, but they're <laughs> a year out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, there's a labor shortage, so I, I imagine you know you're oftentimes settling for inexperienced guys, or mm -hmm. or or the the guys who have experience, they're going to be probably more expensive and busy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sure, construction right now is is a major bottleneck. I have to imagine. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So, so about this time, did you you decided to get into wholesaling? I mean, I'd I'd um I'd kind of been wholesaling all along. Okay. Um, so you cherry pick. Yeah, I mean, your I would, flips? it would it was more like I wanted to do them all, right? I mean, yeah. I wanted to just conquer the whole world. <laughs> I wanted to flip all of Spokane. Like I saw so much so much need and so much opportunity in Spokane, especially. Yeah. That was kind of my primary market, but, um, yeah, I I uh, you know again the bottleneck was was capital and and finding you know scaling um, in a healthy way it was really easy to grow too quickly at the time so um, yeah it was kind of just a matter of uh, we'll, we were constantly making offers on potential projects but um, if we had you know if our plate was full we would just wholesale them off and so I've been I've been wholesaling in that in that capacity for I don't know t- eight, eight years okay. maybe. I got into it pretty quick. It looked like a good way to not pass up on a deal, but still, yeah, you know, still collect a little bit on on the hunt, which is all. It was always my favorite part, actually, hunting for the deal. Really? Yeah, and that's what I what I um you know I'm I'm not great at laying tile, but I am pretty good at at finding a win win on a, on a real estate contract. Nice. Yeah. And so. and you've also been able to generate a lot of like uh, seller finance deals, right? Yeah, that's 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 something a is little. Is that a conversation more... you bring up, or? Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, and that's something a little bit more recent. My my previous acquisitions manager, he was huge into owner financing. Mm-hmm. He he was uh, give a shout out to Terrence if I can. He was Terrence. Yeah, he was <laughs> he was instrumental in kind of opening my eyes to the possibilities of that. Okay. And um, and then yeah, that's just been that's kind of a newer newer development, but. I kind of just tell the seller, like, hey, I don't know if this cash number will work for you, but I think I could probably get you more money if you can get a little bit flexible on when I cash you out. You know, if you, how much do you need at closing to make, you know, to make your, to make a, make it a win for you? Yeah, 7,000. Yes. Just <laughs> enough to move. <laughs> yeah. And that's a lot of times what it, what it ends up being. So it's like, mm-hmm. all right, well, I mean, if you just need five or 10 grand within the next couple of weeks and you can wait for the rest of it, then I think I can pay you an extra five or 10 grand okay. when, it's, when, it's, when all the dust settles. So if you don't mind me asking, how, so how do you go along um, or how do you wholesale a seller finance deal? Like how do you build in your fees? Yeah. Um, um, that's a great question. I mean, really, it just it kind of lump it in with the down payment. Okay. So um, I just go to my investor partners and say, hey, here's an owner financing deal we've um, put together. And uh, if you want to pay me 10, 10 grand or 20 grand or whatever my fee might be for the contract, yep. then you can step in as the buyer and, um, and then you'll be paying, you know, s- seller 10 grand as a down payment. And then your monthly payments will be X. Uh, per month until you know the balloon payoff or whatever whatever the terms might be right yeah do you bring up like a do you ever bring up subject two as an option do you ever get into that rabbit hole yeah definitely yeah yeah yeah, i've done a couple of subject two deals and Mm -hmm. those are those are tricky you know it can be but they could be great oh yeah i've got a couple yeah do you okay Mm -hmm. very cool Yeah. yeah It's an, I mean, if it's if that's the route we need to go, and that's what makes most sense for everybody, um, then I'm I'm totally comfortable with it. It's just a matter of, of um, you know, just making sure it's a good fit for the seller. For for those out there that have no idea what we're talking about, do you mind talking? Do you mind talking a little bit about subject two and what? Sure. And what yeah, that I mean, means and what what risks are involved and how it can benefit everybody. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so subject two is really just uh, buying a property from a seller but leaving their loan in place on the property. So okay. say they owe Chase Bank a hundred thousand, and you've agreed to purchase it purchase it for a hundred and fifty thousand. Um, you leave the hundred thousand dollar loan to Chase Bank in place, and then you assume basically assume making payments on that loan. Mm-hmm. And then for say the fifty thousand dollars on in addition to that, you set up a you set up a second position loan payable to the seller for their fifty thousand dollars equity. Okay. Less any down payments that they may want to receive at closing. Okay. And this is not to be confused with the proper assumption. So you're right. you're just taking over payments for Chase Bank and you mm-hmm. didn't get approval through Chase Bank to do this, right? Right. No, and and um I mean, it is built into Chase's paperwork that there's a due on sale clause, and so that's that's the it's kind of the one of the caveats is that the seller's agreement with Chase Bank is that they're to um, pay off the loan if they're ever to sell and transfer title of the property. 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of it's 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 um it's putting it's exposing yourselves to kind of going against that clause within the loan paperwork, and if if Chase Bank uh, wanted to, they could execute their um you know execute on that clause and, re- and demand a payoff of the loan. Yeah. Given that that clause wasn't adhered to within the loan. And how how often do you think that happens? I mean, I really. I really can't say for sure. I've I've never heard of it happening, and I couldn't foresee it um, being something that would happen. But you know that is that is uh, that is you're exposing yourself to going against that clause within the lending paperwork for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it is it is um, I've never heard of it happening, and in, and as long as Chase Bank is receiving their monthly payment and everything's in the green on that loan, there's really no reason. For them to call it due or send it into the red because it's kind of just fumbles up everything yeah, for everybody. It's still a performing asset for them. Right. So why would they want to cause? Why move it to a just, non-performing asset? Yeah. And a lot of times too, like that loan is probably because they they reserve the right to. They don't have a due on sale clause if they sell their loan their their right. end of the contract. <laughs> So yep. by the time you sell your side, it's probably been transferred on their end like twelve times. Mm-hmm. So to go back all the way through, and it's probably been split up too. I mean, multiple owners. Who knows? It's hard to say. They're they're allowed to do whatever they want on their end. Yeah. Um, Payments are being made though. Yeah. Ninety five percent of the time, nothing's gonna yeah. happen with that yeah. loan. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's some uh, there's some other you know caveats. I mean, I would recommend sending everything through a escrow company. I, I it's yeah. a good idea to transfer um, title into a into a trust prior to prior to transferring ownership to the new buyer. There's a couple other things, but I usually just run it through the attorney and they've, you know, they've, they've, they know, they know what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The, the, the thing that I like, all this is confusing. I, I imagine when I heard, when I first heard this kind of stuff on a podcast or whatever, my, I, I just went cross-eyed. I was like, okay, not doing any of that. That sounds crazy, but it's a great way to get in though. It is a great way if to get in. you don't have much, ma- and what much I, money. What I realized was it's really just a matter of writing it into the into the bottom of my contract that, hey, this property is to be purchased subject to. And then sending that over to the attorney. Say, hey, I, it's not, me and this seller want to want to get into this where we just leave the loan in place. Can you help us out with that? And they, they handle all the other yeah. mumbo jumbo garbage. On the Same with seller side. financing. Exactly. Exactly. Well, say, uh, what what interest are you thinking? Uh, how long of a term? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll send that to the escrow company. They'll figure it out. Exactly. They'll, they'll draw up a note for us and <laughs> yeah. they'll record it. They'll do the. They'll yeah. handle all those sticky details. Yeah. yeah. We just have to ha- have an idea of what we're agreeing to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, you could literally <laughs> draft it up on a napkin yeah. or have like a halfway formulated plan and send. just send it over to the closer and say, "Hey, help us figure this out." And they'll they'll handle all the mumbo jumbo. So here locally, what which um, title company is your favorite one um, to deal with or escrow company? Yeah, I'm, I like dealing with Melissa Stone at Lucent Law. Okay, she's she's super um, investor friendly. She just know, she just gets it. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of people in the industry they they kind of stick rigidly to their their entry point into real estate, and uh, she's 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 great to work with. She understands kind of the whole the whole uh, just ha- just how dynamic everything can get. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. So at this stage in your career, um, are you, would you consider, are you still self-employed, business owner? What, like, could you walk away and things yeah. still work? I mean, I'm or... kind of in limbo to, right now, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't really want to make any long-term plans to scale and, and get super crazy right, right now. Yeah. Just, um, just because it's, it's just an environment I'm, I'm still kind of getting my bearings on. I don't know which direction it's heading or what's going to happen next. Um, it just seems to to me it's just it's like yeah real estate's really great but that's that scares the crap out of me to yeah. be honest with you like that's I think that's when so you have anxiety like I do about this market You're like what? yeah I totally do like I don't fucking have enough money to buy oh, up man. stuff in a couple of years oh, when everything's gosh. blood on the streets yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be caught in that oh man when yeah, yeah when everybody's just super jazzed and excited. I get nervous. <laughs> I'm like, okay, the herd is heading that way. Which direction am I going exactly? Yeah. You know? Just stay so. home playing Grand Theft Auto for a while <laughs> <laughs> until things cool off. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it's tempting. Yeah, it is. Well, and, But then again, you look at like local projection, you're like, well, there's no way it can crash this year. <laughs> right? That's what they <laughs> always say, though. No, they're going to stay down again this year. Oh, How is that possible? Bro. Yeah. People keep moving here. Amazon's here. 
There's no way. Yeah. But Tesla stock's way up. It's not going down. Yeah. <laughs> the thing, though, is like before the Fed, they had the ability to lower the interest rate and artificially play with play with market. That 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 uh, chip has long sailed. They never increased interest rates. They were never able to tax us any more than the bare minimum over the last even since the beginning of the recession. I mean, it's just like if. I don't know, man. If 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 the it's the economy, it's what it's gonna be. If the economy shifts, then yeah, there's no inventory, but real estate market's gonna be forced to shift along shift along with it. I think you know it's not gonna be ideal. I think, I mean, I don't know, man. If things turn, then I I just think that people are gonna have to come up with new and creative solutions like bunking up and and I, I mean if, if I'm just saying if people's you know money gets spread thinner. Yeah. Then I mean I just can't see them still being able to afford like twenty to fifty percent rent hikes, you know, that we're, that we're seeing. It's just yeah, people are getting priced out. I think so, man. I just don't. They're they're only going to be able to afford so much, mm -hmm. and the mortgages are only going to make sense for so long and for so many people before like housing. Like, dude, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to afford a two hundred fifty thousand dollar or three hundred thousand dollar mortgage in Spokane. The the wages are stagnant and they haven't really kept up and and it's possible very possible that they may slide a little bit right now you know i mean mm -hmm. i hate and this is all doom and gloom type crap but <laughs> and i understand that well it's common sense i yeah. mean just if it's so funny i looked at I, I look at the hot sheets every day what's what's new on the market what's coming mm -hmm. up and i i just noticed half of these normal houses are in the 400s now yeah i'm like mm -hmm. I, and I was just over the weekend. My sister in law is a doctor. She I helped her buy a house on the river. It was four seventy five at the time. River house. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Access. She's got to dock. That was a four hundred thousand dollar house at the time. Right. Yeah. Today, mm -hmm. that's just what you're gonna spend if you want to move into a bigger house. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing fancy. Yeah, and that's it's true pretty, for Spokane. Like the Spokane like market. People can't afford that with a forty four thousand dollar annual income no they can't but they're also competing <laughs> against money coming in from other markets you know mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of people moving from bigger metro areas into our smaller metro areas where things with cost of, you know cost of living was low and housing prices were low and rent was low we're seeing um we're seeing that kind of change quickly right now but I mean, I'm I'm not, I'm not I'm not claiming to be an expert or anything on any of this stuff. I'm just trying to pay attention. You yeah. Know? Um, so what? So what are you gonna do? <laughs> no, like, so you're uh, are you scaling back a little bit? I scaled way, man. I'm you know, like I said, it wasn't even it's not even possible for us to buy 50 flips in a year right now. It yeah. Would, it would be difficult for us to buy 10 probably. Definitely not at the foreclosure auction. And to do it on a scaled on a, on a scaled way, like with employees and overhead and everything else, just you know, we'd be priced out really fast. So um, right now, I'm I'm kind of just I'm back to self-employed, and um, mm -hmm. it's been interesting, man. I, I realized I got pretty complacent being the being the fatty at the top of the pyramid, you know. Um, out of, I got it was it was interesting to get out of touch and complacent, and kind of lazy, being the guy who is just like, oh, I'm just the mastermind, I'm gonna scale all this crap. Right. And so now now I've, uh, man, and now I've just, I'm back to getting my hands dirty, I'm actually loving it, and okay. staying active, staying busy. And um, and it's, it's just being, not being scaled has allowed me a lot more freedom. I don't have, uh, I don't have nearly the employees. I kept just, I have a rock star team right now. Shout out to Ross and Kat. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you mind sharing what your team looks like? Yeah, so Ross is the CFO. He oversees, man, he, he oversees just day-to-day -day, um, accounting, bookkeeping, admin, and he's he's kind of, the, he, in a lot of ways, he's the glue. Like, he, okay. he, he's been with me for, for a real long time, and, and he's got a really strong business sense, and he's very practical. He kind of keeps me grounded. I'm the, I'm the head in the clouds yeah. entrepreneur. Wants to wants to do everything and anything and <laughs> and, and conquer everybody and everything. But um, Ross is great. And then there's Kat. She's my marketing uh, director. C, she's chief operations officer, and mm -hmm. she she oversees the day to day. Make sure the machine stays up and running. Marketing. Okay. Um, and yeah, just kind of the day to day operations. Do you, do you have much of a, a rental portfolio? 
No, no, I sold sold the rentals. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Um, sold the rentals and and then I was just doing flips for a while. But now now it's primarily wholesale, primarily wholesales. And I've scaled it way back, just kind of like I'm a professional buyer in a seller's market right now, you know? So it's it's kinda of like what I mean It's a big skill. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so it is kind of like, which direction do I want to go? And I think I think things on the retail side, like I think now is a, probably a great time to be a realtor. I think I think you confirmed that for me last time we spoke on the phone. But um, like the the astute property owners mm-hmm. are going to be cashing out soon if they haven't already. And yeah. I think those astute property owners are talking to their local realtor to maximize the returns. You know. Um, they, yeah, it's a double-edged sword because then they then they have a place to go. Right. If they oh, want yeah. to sell their personal house or, <laughs> yeah. or yeah. or if they want to sell their rentals, it's like okay, well, where do I put this money? Mm-hmm. <laughs> where where yeah. do I put it where it's not just gonna fall yeah. over? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's um, totally true. I'm so sure. that that's been a big problem because rents are crazy and they're gonna continue. To, I, they seem like they're just going up still. Mm-hmm. There's no. I I kind of I have this theory that rents are gonna go way down in this area once all of the apartments are built out. Mm. I feel like that's gonna bring for for multifamily mostly. I don't think single family rentals are gonna be hurt as bad mm-hmm. by any means. Mm-hmm. But I could be way wrong. This area can just continue to grow in population, and we'll have a a never ending supply problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does kind of seem like people are fleeing the major metro areas to come to to markets like this one. And so we already have an inventory shortage. They're going to be, I mean, I think we're we're definitely not heading the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. Um, People are able to work remotely more often than they were. I kind of think the inventory problem could be something that sticks around. It It might even be the era of development, you know, who's, it's really hard to say. Mm-hmm. It's, every market's much more um, kind of regionally based, though it seems like the last the last thing last major adjustments we saw were on a national scale. Now it seems like now it seems like the real estate market's more regional specific. Is that something that seems true for you? It's it just won't slow down here mm-hmm. locally. Mm-hmm. And I don't really pay attention too much anymore nationally what's going on. I mean, I, 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 we, I did go over like a, um, just in my last REI meeting nationally what's, what the, the broad idea for what, what's going to happen this year based off last year's numbers. And it seems like we're going to have another 5% growth or so. And mortgage rates should remain steady in mm-hmm. the upper 30s. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it might not have... You know, things are starting to wind down potentially nationwide. Mm-hmm. But then when you look locally, it's just numbers are different. And real estate's very local. Right. I and mean, it's like, what's the average temperature of the U.S.? <laughs> doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like real estate's all local. And I, I just, um, it's it's hard to keep up with with everything that's going on mm-hmm. here locally. And yeah. that's, I, I do the best I can to have a good grasp on each project that I get into and hyper focus on that area and yeah. try to predict yeah 12 months out yeah I mean and that's that's a good that's a safe bet I mean as long as you're playing in that that ballpark the 12 months or less you mm-hmm. should be able to you should be able to stay safe usually yeah and I always I try to, every project I try to have a backup plan with you know will this property rent for more than what it costs per month yeah and I won't do a deal if it doesn't yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. In case it has to fall into a rental, but um, so it sounds like you're you're staying flexible and taking on whatever kind of whatever comes up, rentals, flips. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, and and like you said, flips have died down like crazy, just because they're just overpriced. Yeah, and it and you just can't make what and and I don't want to get stuck in a property that's, you know, potentially, not worth what I think it's going to be worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of pressure um, to to pay quite a bit on the buy side. So I just recently started getting into some new construction. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, found a couple of great deals on lots in, a, um, in Dover, Idaho. There you go. And we're going to um, at least build two houses over there, maybe more. Oh, so cool. So that's my next 
that's my next venture, and I'll continue to keep out for great. I I really like uh, single family rentals. Yeah. So. Yeah, I do too. Keeping a lookout for those. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Are you done with rentals for now then? I th- yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, I'm kind of just uh, I'm kind of just trying to compile a bunch of cash, and then I think I'm just gonna work on. I, I, I'm I just love business, man. Whether whether my product is real estate or if it's something else, yeah. um, I just kind of I just kind of love having a bu- growing a business. Do you have any other businesses outside of real estate that you're working on or have worked um, on in the past? I mean, shoot, I've dabbled in a, I've dabbled, I've dabbled in a lot of things, but um, I'm kind of like I like sticking to one primary, one primary business rather than spreading myself out. Mm-hmm. Um, so not not right now. No, I I've dabbled, dabbled with a construction company, a marketing company, okay. uh, the flip company, obviously, and yeah. But right right now, I'm kind of. Um, yeah, just self-employed, really. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you still doing wholesales in multiple markets? Um, no, not so much. I mean, we're 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 dabbling a little bit in North Idaho. Okay. Um, I had some marketing partners in the Seattle area and the Corvallis area, um, and, but no, not right not right now. I'm more just focused on. I, I really did just re, I retracted a lot, you know, um, and just kind of trying to feel out which direction it's going to be. Um, look, really, just looking for the opportunities, you know. And and I, it's it, I'm comfortable knowing that I can I can turn a profit working for myself by myself with just a small team. Yeah. Whether or not I can, I I'm just looking for an opportunity to. Um, I'm just looking for that one opp- business opportunity to, to that I can really devote myself into scaling and pushing into into growing. And I I don't know that I've fully identified it yet. Okay. You know. Yeah. So. Gotcha. But I'm, I'm I'm super open to it, man. I'm looking. I'm ready to. I'm ready to just start running with running with some kind of business system. I have I have some I have some ideas of what it might be. I mean, I senior housing. <laughs> <laughs> senior housing. I can sense it. Oh, <laughs> Not <boy>. just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's my bag, man. <laughs> but start you're right. On the ground I mean, floor, changing diapers. Oh man, like there's there's gonna be a lot of baby boomers needing some assistance. You know. That's yeah. for sure going to be a, a really great market, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I don't know, who knows? Who knows? I mean, that, that could be could be something interesting. Do you think it will always relate to real estate, or are you open to all kinds of opportunities? I'm really open to whatever, um, to be honest. I like I love real estate. I think it's made more millionaires than anything else. Like yeah. I, I've heard that a lot, and I, I believe that that's true. Um, and it, at some point, I, I always kind of knew, like, Regardless of what I did, I wanted to be an expert in real estate because that's, in my opinion, when I, I read, I sat down Rich Dad Poor Dad, I had a bunch of money in savings and I was like, mm-hmm. I want to find the absolute best investment available and I want to, I want to become an expert in it. And then it just kind of got out of hand. Then I went full time and everything else. But my original intention was just to find, a, you know, just to master one investment strategy, not, not necessarily making that a profession. That's how it ended up. But, um, I guess I'm just I'm thankful that I do know this industry inside and out, but I'm open to I'm open to you know business elsewhere. Okay. Yeah. So um, since since we got a lot of people probably here hearing this and watching it, do you do you want them to reach out to you with their business opportunities to you directly? <laughs> definitely not. And go through. No, no yeah. definitely. Not. <laughs> That's a no, everyone. <laughs> No, I don't do it. No, like like you, man. Like I'm I'm here because I love making new connections. Um, and I I think if uh, if, yeah, if somebody thinks that we might be able to make money together and, and enjoy working together, then I'm all for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the best way is probably to just find me on social media, Jacob Evans, um, or just email me Jacob D Evans at Gmail. Right on. I appreciate you having, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, That's thanks awesome. for having me out, man. Thanks for uh, all that you do, and uh, I know a lot of people look up to you. So yeah. hopefully you stay in the area for sure. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't run back off to Texas. Thanks for tuning in to the Investor Shed podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel for instant access to all future episodes. If you or someone you know has investing experience or stories to share, reach out to us in the comments or via email.